The Adventure of the Golden Pincenez. When I look back at the three massive manuscript volumes which contain our work from the year 1894, I confess it is very difficult for me, out of such a wealth of material, to select the cases which are most interesting in themselves, and at the same time most conductive to a display of those peculiar powers for which my friend was famous. As I turn over the pages, I see my notes upon the repulsive story of the Red Leech and the terrible death of Crosby the Banker. Here also I find an account of the Adelton tragedy and the singular contents of the ancient British borrow. The famous Smith Mortimer succession cause comes also within this period, and so does the tracking of the arrest of Hurt, the Boulevard Assassin an exploit which won my, for Holmes, an autograph of letter thanks from the French President and the Order of the Legion of Honor. Each of these would furnish a narrative, but on the whole I am of opinion that none of them unite so many singular points of interest as the episode of Yoxley Old Place, which includes not only the lamentable death of young Willoughby Smith, but also those subsequent developments which threw so curious a light upon the cases of the crime. It was a wild, tempestuous night towards the close of November. Holmes and I sat together in silence in the evening, engaged with powerful limbs, deciphering the remains of original inscription upon the pamphlet. I deepen a recent treatise upon surgery. Outside, the wind howled down Baker Street, while the rain beat fiercely against the windows. It was a strange there, in the very depths of the town, with ten miles of, no, of man's handiwork on every side of us, to feel the iron grip of nature, and to be conscious that the huge elemental forces of all London was no more than molehills that dot the fields. I walked to the window and looked out upon the deserted street. The occasional lamps gleamed on the expanse of the muddy road and shining pavement. A single cab was splashing its way from Oxford Street End. Well, Watson, that's as well as we have not out turn out tonight, said Holmes, laying aside his lens and rolling up his pamphlet. I've done enough in one setting. It is trying for work for the eyes. So far I can make out that it is nothing more exciting than an Abbey's accounts dating to the second half of the 15th century. Hello, 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 what's this? Amid the droning of the wind, there had come a stamping of horses' hooves and a long grind of a wheel as it rasped against the curb. The cab which I had seen had pulled up at our door. What can he want, I ejaculated, as the man stepped out of it. Want? He wants us, and we, my poor Watson, want overcoats and cravats and galoshes, and every aid that man ever invented to fight the weather. Wait a bit, though. There's the cab again. There's hope yet. He'd have kept it if he had wanted us to come. Run down, my dear old fellow, and open the door, for all our virtuous folk have been long been bed. When the light of the hall lamp fell upon our midnight visitor, I had difficulty in recognizing him. It was a young Stanley Hopkins, a promising detective in whose career Holmes had several times shown a very practical interest. Is he in? he asked eagerly. Come up, my dear sir, said Holmes, voice from above. I hope you have no designs upon us on such a night as this. The detective mounted the stairs, and our lamp gleamed upon this shining waterproof. I helped him out of it while Holmes knocked a blaze out of the logs in the grate. Now, my dear Watton, my dear Hopkins, draw up and warm your toes, he said. Here's a cigar, and the doctor has prescription to containing hot water and lemon, which is good medicine on a night like this. It must be something important which has brought you out in such a gale. It is indeed, Mr. Holmes. I've had a bustling afternoon, I promise you. Did you see anything of the Oxley case in the latest editions? I have seen nothing later than the 15th century today. 
Well, it was on a polygraph and all wrong with that. So you have not missed anything. I haven't let the grass grow under my feet. It's down in Kit, seven miles from Chatham and three miles away from the railway line. I was wired at for at 3.15, reached Yoxley Old Place at 5, conducted my investigation, and was back at Charing Cross by the last train, and straight to you by cab. Which means, I suppose, that you are not quite clear about your case. It means I have... It means I can make neither head nor tail of it. So far as I can see, it's just tangled of business as I ever handled. And yet, at first, it seemed so simple that one couldn't go wrong. There's no motive, Mr. Holmes. That's what bothers me. I can't put my hand on a motive. Here's a man dead. There's no denying that. But so far as I can see, no reason on earth why anyone should wish him harm. Holmes lit his cigar and leaned back in his chair. Let us hear about it. He said... I've got my facts pretty clear, said Stanley Hopkins. All I want now is to know what they all mean. The story, so far as I can make it out, is like this. Some years ago, this country house, Yuxley Old Place, was taken by an elderly man whose name was Cor Professor Corum. He was an invalid, keeping in his bed half the time, and the other half hobbling around the house with a stick or being pushed around by the grounds by the gardener in his bath chair. He was well liked by a few neighbors who called upon him, and he has a reputation down there of being a very learned man. His household used to consist of an elderly housekeeper, Mrs. Marker, and a maid, Susan Tarleton. These have both been with him since his arrival, and they seem to be women of excellent character. The professor is writing a learned book, and he found it necessary about a year ago to engage a secretary. The first two that he tried were not a success, but the third, Mr. Willoughby Smith, a very young man straight from the university, seems to have been just what his employer wanted. His work consisted in writing all the morning to the professor's dictation, and he usually spent the evening in hunting up references and passages which bore upon the next day's work. This Willoughby Smith has nothing against him, either as a boy at Uppingham or as a young man at Cambridge. I've seen his testimonials, and from the first, he was a very decent, quiet, hard-working fellow with no weak spot in him at all. And yet this lad, who has met his death this morning in the professor's study under circumstances which can point only to murder. The wind howled and screamed at the windows. Holmes and I drew closer to the fire while the young inspector slowly and point by point developed his singular narrative. If you were to search all of England, said he, I don't suppose you could find a household more self-contained or free from outside influences. Whole weeks would pass and not one of them would go past the garden gate. The professor was buried in his work and existed for nothing else. The young Smith knew nobody in the neighborhood and lived very much as his employer did. The two women had nothing to take them from the house. Mortimer the gardener, who wheels the bath chair, is an army pensioner and an old Crimean man of excellent character. He does not live in the house, but a three-roomed cottage at the other end of the garden. Those are the only people that you would find within the grounds of old Yoxley Old Place, and at the same time, the gate of the garden is a hundred yards from the main London to Chatham Road. It opens with a latch, and there's nothing to prevent anyone from walking in. Now I will give you evidence of Susan Tarleton, who is the only person who can say anything positive about the matter. It was in the afternoon between 11 and 12. She was engaged at the moment in hanging some curtains in the upstairs front bedroom. Professor Quorum was still in bed, for when the weather is bad he seldom rises before midday. The housekeeper was busy with some work in the back of the house. Willoughby Smith had been in his bedroom, which he uses as a sitting room. But the maid heard him at that moment pass along the passage and descend to the study and immediately blow her. She could not see him, but she says that she could not be mistaken by his quick, firm tread. She did not hear the study door close, but a minute or so later, there was a dreadful cry in the room below. 
There was a wild, hoarse scream, so strange and unnatural that it might have come from either a man or a woman. At the same instant, there was a heavy thud which shook the whole house, and then all was silent. The maid stood petrified for a moment, and then, recovering her courage, she ran downstairs. The study door was shut, and she opened it. Inside, Mr. Willoughby Smith was stretched upon the floor. At first, she could see no injury, but she tried to raise him, and she saw that blood was pouring out from underside of his neck. It was pierced by a very small, but very deep wound, which was divided in the cardioid artery. The instrument with which the injury had been inflicted lay upon the carpet beside him. It was one of those small sealing wax knives to be found in old-fashioned writing tables, with an ivory handle and a stiff blade. It was part of the fittings of the professor's own desk. At first, the maid thought the young smith was already dead, but on pouring some water over the craft over his forehead, his eyes opened for an instant. The professor, he murmured. It was he. It was she. The maid was prepared to swear that those were the exact words. He tried desperately to say something else and held his right hand up in the air. Then he fell back dead. In the meantime, the housekeeper had also arrived upon the scene, but she was just too late to catch the young man's dying words. Leaving Susan with the body, she hurried to the professor's room. He was stirring up in bed, horribly agitated, for he had heard enough to convince him that something terrible had occurred. Mrs. Marker was prepared to swear that the professor was still in his nightclothes, and indeed, it was impossible for him to get dressed without help of Mortimer, whose orders were to come at twelve o'clock. The professor declares that he heard a distant cry, but that he knows nothing more. He can give no explanation of the young man's last words. The professor, it was she, but imagines that they were the outcome of delirium. He believes that Willoughby Smith had not an enemy in the world and can give no reason for the crime. His first reaction was to send Mortimer to the gardener for the local police. A little later, the chief constable sent for me. Nothing was moved before I got there, and strict orders were given that no one should walk upon the path leading to the house. It was a splendid chance of putting your theories into practice, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. There was really nothing wanting. Except, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said my companion with a somewhat bitter smile. Well, let us hear about it. What sort of job did you make of it? I must say, and ask you first, Mr. Holmes, no glance at this rough plan, which will give you the general idea of the position of the professor's study and the various points of the case. It will help you with the following of my investigation. He unfolded a rough chart, which I... He reproduce, and he laid it across Holmes's knee. I rose, and standing behind Holmes, I studied it over his shoulder. It is very rough, of course, and it only deals with the points that seem to be essential. All the rest you will see later for yourself. Now, first of all, presuming that the assassin entered the house, how did he or she come in? Undoubtedly by the garden path, by the back door, which... There is direct across from study. Any other would have been exceedingly complicated. The escape must have also been made along that line, for the other two exits from the room. One is blocked by Susan, and she ran downstairs, and the other leads straight to the professor's bedroom. I therefore directed my attention at once to the garden path, which was saturated with recent rain and would certainly show any footmarks. My examination showed me that I was dealing with a cautious and expert criminal. No footmarks were found on the path. There could be no question, however, that someone had passed along the grass border which lines the path, and that he had done so in order to avoid leaving a track. I could not find anything in the nature of a distinct impression, but the grass was trodden down and someone had undoubtedly passed. It could only have been the murder, since neither the gardener nor anyone else had been there that morning, and the rain had only begun during the night. One moment, said Holmes. Where does this path lead to? To the road. How long is it? A hundred yards or so. At the point where the path passes through the gate, 
you surely pick up the tracks. Unfortunately, the path was tilled at that point. Well, on the road itself. No, it was all trodden into mire. Tut, tut. Well, then, these tracks upon the grass, were they coming or going? It was impossible to say. There was never any outline. A large foot or a small? You could not distinguish. Holmes gave an ejaculation of impatience. It has been pouring rain and blowing a hurricane ever since, said he. It will be harder to read them now than in the pamphlet. Well, well, it can't be helped. What did you, what did you do, Hopkins, after you made the certain that you had made certain of nothing? I think I made certain a good deal, Mr. Holmes. I knew that someone had entered the house cautiously from without. I next examined the corridor, and it was lined with coconut matting and had taken no impression of any kind. This brought me into the study itself. It was scantily furnished room. The main article was a large writing table with a fixed bureau. This bureau consists of a double column of drawers with a central small cupboard between them. The drawers were open, the cupboard locked. The drawers, it seems, were always open and nothing of value was kept in them. There were some papers of importance in the cupboard, but there were no signs that this had been tampered with and the professor assures me that nothing was missing. It is certain that no robbery has been committed. I come now to the body of the young man. It was found near the bureau and just to the left of it, as marked upon the chart. The stab was on the right side of the neck and from behind forwards, so that it was almost impossible to have been self-inflicted. Unless he fell upon the knife, said Holmes. Exactly, the idea crossed my mind, but we found the knife some feet away from the body, so it seems impossible. Then, of course, there are the man's own dying words, and finally, there was this very important piece of evidence which was found clasped in the dead man's right hand. From his pocket, Stanley Hopkins drew a small paper packet. He unfolded it and disclosed a gold nez piece nez, with two broken ends of a black silk cord dangling from the end of it. Willoughby Smith had excellent sight, he added. There can be no question this was snatched from the face of the person of the assassin. Sherlock Holmes took the glasses into his hand and examined them with the utmost attention and interest. He held them on his nose, endeavored to read through them, went to the window and stared up the street with them, looked at them most minutely in the full light of the lamp, and finally, with a chuckle, seated himself upon the table and wrote a few lines upon a sheet of paper which he tossed across to Stanley Hopkins. That's the best I can do for you, he said. It may prove to be of some use. The astonished detective read the note aloud. It ran as follows. Wanted. A woman for good address, attired like a lady. She has a remarkably thick nose, with eyes which are set so close upon either side of it. She has a puckered forehead, a peering expression, and probably rounded shoulders. These are indications that she has run the discourse to an op optician at least twice during the past few months. As her glasses are of the remarkable strength, and the opticians are not very numerous, there should be no difficulty in tracing her. Holmes smiled at the astonishment of the Hopkins which must have been reflected upon my features. Surely my deductions are simplicity itself, said he. It would be difficult to name any articles which afford a finer held for inference than a pair of glasses, especially so remarkable a pair as these. That they belong to a woman, I infer to their delicacy, and also, of course, from the last words of the dying man. As to her being a person of refinement and well-dressed, they are, as you perceive, handsomely mounted in solid gold, and it is inconceivable that anyone who wore such glasses should be slatternly in other respects. You will find that the clips are far too wide for your nose, showing that the lady's nose was very broad at the base. 
this sort of nose is usually a short and coarse one, and there are a sufficient number of exceptions to prevent me from being dogmatic, from insisting upon the point in my description. My own face is a narrow one, and yet I find that I cannot get my eyes into the center, or near the center, of these glasses. Therefore, the lady's eyes are not are set very near to the sides of her nose. You'll perceive, Watson, that the glasses are concave and of unusual strength. A lady whose vision has been so extremely contracted all her life is sure to have a physical characteristics of such vision, which are seen in the forehead, the eyelids, and the shoulders. Yes, I said. I can follow each of your arguments. I confess, however, that... I am unable to understand how you attire the double visits to an optician. Holmes took the glasses into his hand. You'll perceive, said he, that the clips are lined with tiny bands of cork, so often the pressure upon the nose. One of these is discolored and worn to some slight extent, but the other is new. Evidently one of these has fallen off and had been replaced. I should judge that the order of them has not been more than a few months. They exactly correspond, so I gather the lady went back to the same establishment for the second. By George, it's marvellous, cried Hopkins in an ecstasy of admiration. To think that I had the evidence in my hand and never knew it. I had intended, however, to go around the London opticians. Of course you would. Meanwhile, have you anything more to tell us about the case? Nothing, Mr. Holmes. I think that you know as much as I do, probably more. We have had inquiries made as to strangers seen in the country roads and the railway station. I have heard that none. What beats me is the utter want of all object of the crime. Not a ghost or a motive can be... Can anyone suggest? Ah! There I am not in a position to help you, but I suppose you want us to come out tomorrow. If it's not asking too much, Mr. Holmes, there's a train from Charing Cross to Chatham at six in the morning, and we should be at Yoxley Old Place between eight and nine. Then we shall take it. Your case has certainly some features of great interest, and I shall be delighted to look into it. Well, it's nearly one, and we had best rest for a few hours sleep. I dare say you can manage all right on the sofa in front of the fire. I'll light my spirit lamp and give you a cup of coffee before we start. The gale had blown itself out the next day, but it was a bitter morning when we started upon our journey. We saw the cold winter sun rise above the dreary marshes of the Thames and the long sullen reaches of the river, which I shall ever associate with our pursuit of the Enderman Islander, in those earlier days of our career. After a long and weary journey, we alighted to a small station some miles from Chatham. While a horse was being put into our trap at the local inn, we snatched a hurried breakfast, and so we were all ready for business when we at last arrived at Yoxley Old Place. A constable met us at the garden gate. Well, Wilson, any news? No, nothing, sir. No strangers to report, not seen. No, sir. Down at the station they were certain that no stranger either came or went yesterday. Have you made any inquiries at the inns or lodgings? Um, yes, sir. There was no one that we could not account for. Well, then it's only reasonable walk to Chatham. Anyone might stay there, or take a train without being observed. This is the garden path of which I spoke, Mr. Holmes. I pledge my word that there was no mark upon it yesterday. On which side were the marks of the grass? This side, sir. The narrow, the narrow margins of grass between the path and the flower bed. I can't see traces now, but they were clear for me then. Yes, yes. Someone has passed along, said Holmes, stooping over with a glass border. Our lady must have picked her steps carefully. Must she not, since on one side she would leave a track of the path, and on the other an even clearer one in the soft bed. Yes, sir, she must have been a cool hand. I saw the intent look pass over Holmes's face. You say that she must have come back this way. Yes, sir, there's no other. On this strip of grass. Certainly, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. 
It was a very remarkable performance. Very remarkable. Well, I think we have exhausted the path. Let us go farther. This garden door is usually kept open, I propose. And then the visitor had nothing to do but walk in. The idea of a murder was not in her mind, or she would have not provided herself with some sort of weapon, instead of having to pick up this knife at the writing table. She advanced along this corridor, leaving no traces upon the coconut matting. Then she found herself in the study. How long was she there? We have no means of judging. No more than a few minutes, sir. I forgot to tell you that Mrs. Marker, the housekeeper, had been in there tidying before very long. Uh, about a quarter of an hour, she says. Well, that gives us a limit. Our lady enters the room, and what does she do? She goes over to the writing table. What for? Not for anything in the drawers. If there had been anything worth her lock taking, it would have surely been locked up. No, it was something in the wooden bureau. Hello. What is this scratch up on the face of it? Just hold a match, Watson. Why did you not tell us about this, Hopkins? The mark which he was examining began upon the brass work of the right-hand side of the keyhole, and extended for about four inches, where it was scratched the varnish from the surface. I noticed it, Mr. Holmes, but you always find scratches around the keyhole. Yes, this is recent, quite recent. You see how the brass blemishes where it shine. It was cut. The old cut would have had the same color of the surface. Look at this through my lens. There's the varnish too, like earth on each side of the furrow. Is Mrs. Marker here? A sad-faced elderly woman came into the room. Did you dust the bureau yesterday morning? Yes, sir. Did you notice a scratch? No, sir, I did not. I'm sure you did not do it, for it is a disaster who swept away with these threads of varnish. Who has the key of this bureau? The uh, professor keeps it on his watch chain. Is it the single key? No, sir, it's a Chubb's key. Very well, Miss Marker, you can go now. Now we have the makings of a little progress. Our lady enters the room, advances to the bureau, and either opens it or tries to do so. While she is thus engaged, young Willoughby Smith enters the room. In a hurry to withdraw the key, she makes the scratch upon the door. He seizes her and, snatching up the nearest object, which happens to be this knife, strikes him in order to make him let go of his hold. The blow is a fatal one. He falls and she escapes, either with or without the object for which he came. Is Susan the maid here? Could anyone have got away through the door after the time you heard the cry, Susan? No, sir, it's impossible. Before I got down the stair, I'd have seen anyone in the passage. Besides, the door never opened, for I would have heard it. That settles this exit. Then there's no doubt the lady came out the way she came. I understand that this is other passage leads only to the professor's room. Is there no exits that way? No, sir. We shall go down it and make the acquaintance of Professor Hop Hello, Hopkins. This is very important, very important indeed. The professor's corridor is also lined with coconut matting. Well, so what of it? Don't you see any bearing upon the case? Well, well, I don't insist upon it. No doubt I am wrong, and yet it seems to me to be very suggestive. Come with me and introduce me. As we walked down the passage, which was the same length at which they led to the garden, at the end of the short flight of steps ending in a door, our guide knocked and then ushered us into the professor's bedroom. It was a large chamber lined with innumerable volumes which had overflowed upon the shelves and lay in piles in the corners, or were stacked all around the base of the cases. The bed was in the center of the room, and in it, propped up with pillows, was the owner of the house. I have seldom seen a more remarkable-looking person. It was a gaunt, aquiline face which was turned upwards with the piercing dark eyes which lurked in deep hollows under overhung and tufted brows. His hair was 
and beard were white, save for the latter was curiously stained with yellow round his mouth. A cigarette glowed amid the tangle of white hair, and the room was fitted with stale tobacco smoke. As he held out his hand to Holmes, I perceived that it was also stained yellow with nicotine. A smoker, Mr. Holmes, he said, speaking well-chosen English with a curious little mincing accent. Pray have a cigarette, and you, sir, I can recommend them. I have them especially prepared for me of Alexandria. He sends me a thousand at a time, and I grieve to say that I have to arrange for a fresh supply of every fortnight. Bad, sir, very bad, but an old man has a few pleasures. Tobacco and my work. That is all that I have left to me. Holmes had lit a cigarette and was shooting little darting glances over the room. Tobacco and my work, but now only tobacco, the old man exclaimed. Alas, what a fatal interruption. Who could have foreseen such a terrible catastrophe? So estimable a man. I assure you that after a few months' training, he was an admirable assistant. What do you think of the matter, Mr. Holmes? I have not yet made up my mind. Indeed, I shall indeed be indebted to you if you can throw a light where all is so dark to us. To a poor bookworm and invalid like myself, such a blow is paralyzing. I seem to have lost the fac faculty of thought. But you are a man of action. You are a man of affairs. It is part of the everyday routine of your life. Can you perceive your brilliance in every emergency? You are fortunate indeed in having you at our side. Holmes was pacing up and down one side of the room whilst the old professor was talking. I observed that he was smoking with extraordinary rapidity. It was evidence that he was sharing our host's liking for the fresh Alexandrian cigarettes. Yes, uh, it's quite a crushing blow, said the old man. That was my magnum opus, the pile of papers on that side table yonder. It is my analysis of the documents found in the Copic monasteries of Syria and Egypt, a work which will cut deep in the very foundation of reveled religion. With my enfeebled health, I do not know whether I shall ever be able to complete it now that my assistance has been taken from me. Dear me, Mr. Holmes, why, you are even quicker smoker than I am myself. Holmes smiled. I am a connoisseur, said he, taking another cigarette from the box, his fourth, and lighting it from the stub which he had just finished. I will not trouble you with a lengthy cross-examination. Professor Coram, since I gather that you were in bed at the time of the crime and could know nothing of it, I would only ask this. What do you imagine that this poor fellow meant by his last words? The professor. It was she. The professor shook his head. <clears throat> Susan was a country girl, said he, and you know the incredible stupidity of that class. I fancy the poor fellow murmured some incoherent, delirious words, and that she twisted them into this meaningless message. I see. You have no explanation yourself of the tragedy. Possibly an accident. Possibly I only breathe it among ourselves a suicide. Young men have their hidden troubles, some affair of the heart, perhaps, which we have never known. It is more probable suspicion than murder. And the eyeglasses. Ah, I am only a student, a man of dreams. I cannot explain the practical things of life. But still, we are aware, my friend, that Love gauges may be strange shapes. By all means, take another cigarette. It is a pleasure to see anyone appreciate them so. A van, a glove, glasses, who knows what article may be carried as a token of treasure when a man puts an end to his life. This gentleman speaks of footsteps in the grass, but after all, it is easy to mistake such a point. As to the knife, it may have been thrown far from the misfortune of the man fell. It is possible that I speak as a child to 
but to me it seems that Willoughby Smith met his fate by his own hand. Holmes seemed struck by the theory thus put forward, and he continued to walk up and down for some time, lost in thought, and consuming a cigarette after cigarette. Tell me, Professor Quorum, said he at last, what is in that cupboard in the bureau? Nothing that help a thief. Family papers, letters from my poor wife, diplomas of universities which have done me no honor. Here's a key. You can look at it for yourself. Holmes picked up the key and looked back at it for an instant. Then he handed it back. Now, I hardly think that it would help me, he said. I should prefer to go quietly down to your garden and turn the whole matter over in my head. There is something to be said for the theory of suicide which you have put in forward. We must apologize for having intruded on you. Professor Quorum and I promise that I won't disturb you until after lunch. At two o'clock we will come again and report to you anything which may have appeared in our interval. Holmes was curiously distracted, and we walked up and down the garden path for some time in silence. Have you some clue? I asked at last. It depends on those cigarettes I smoked. He said, it is possible that I'm utterly mistaken. The cigarettes will show me. My dear Holmes, I exclaimed, how on earth? Well, well, you may see for yourself. If not, there's no harm done. Of course, we always have the optis optician clue to fall back upon, and I will take a shortcut when I get there. Ah, here's a good Mrs. Marker. Let us enjoy five minutes of intrusive, instructive conversation with her. I may have remarked before that Holmes had, when he liked, a particularly ingratiating way with women, and that he very readily established terms of confidence with them. And half the time which he had named, he had captured the housekeeper's goodwill and was chatting with her as if he had known her for years. Yes, Mr. Holmes, it is as you say. He does smoke something terrible. All day and sometimes at night, sir. And we've seen him all that room in the morning. Well, sir, you thought it might have been London Fog. Poor young Mr. Smith. He was a smoker also, but not as bad as a professor. His health, well, I don't know what that's in better or worse for smoking. Ah, said Holmes. But it kills the appetite. Well, I don't know about that, sir. I suppose the professor eats hardly anything. Well, he is variable. I'll say that for him. I'll wager he took no breakfast this morning and won't touch his lunch after the cigarettes I saw him consume. Well, you're out there, sir. As it happens, for he ate a remarkably big breakfast this morning. I don't know when I've known him to make a better one, and he's ordered a good dish of cutlets for his lunch. I'm surprised myself, for since I came into that room yesterday and saw Mr. Smith lying on the floor, I couldn't bear to look at food. Well, it takes all sorts to make a world, and the professor hasn't let it take his appetite away. We loitered the morning away in the garden. Stanley Hopkins had gone down to the village to look into some rumors of a strange woman who had been seen by some children on the Chatham Road the previous morning. As to my friend, all his usual energy seemed to have deserted him. I have never known him to handle a case in such a half-hearted fashion. Even the news brought back by Hopkins that he had found the children and that they had undoubtedly seen a woman exactly corresponding with Holmes's description and wearing either spectacles or eyeglasses failed to rouse any sign of keen interest. He was more attentive when Susan, who waited upon us at lunch, volunteered the information that she believed Mr. Smith had been out for a walk yesterday morning and that he had only returned half an hour before the tragedy occurred. I could not myself see the bearing of this information, but I clearly perceived that Holmes was weaving 
into the general scheme which he had formed in his brain. Suddenly he sprang back from his chair and glanced at his watch. Two o'clock, gentlemen, said he. We must go up and have it out with our friend the professor. The old man had just finished his lunch, and certainly his empty dish bore evidence of a good appetite, which was his housekeeper had credited him. He was indeed a weird figure as he turned his white mane and his glowing eyes towards us. The eternal cigarette smoldered in his mouth. He had been dressed and was sealed, seated in an armchair by the fire. Well, Mr. Holmes, have you solved this mystery yet? He shoved a large tin of cigarettes which stood on a table beside him towards my companion. Holmes stretched out his hand at the same moment, and between them they tipped the box over the edge. For a minute or two, we were all on our knees, retrieving stray cigarettes from impossible places. When we rose again, I observed that Holmes' eyes were shining and his cheeks tinged with color. Only at a crisis have I seen those battle signals flying. Yes, said he, I have solved it. Stanley Hopkins and I stared in amazement. Something like a sneer quivered over the gaunt features of the old professor. Indeed, in the garden? No, here. Here, uh, when? This instant. You are surely joking, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You compel me to tell you that this is too serious a matter to be treated in such a fashion. I have forged and tested every link in my chain, Professor Coram, and I am sure that it is sound. What your motives are, or what exact part you play in this strange business, I am not yet able to say. In a few minutes I shall probably hear it from your own lips. Meanwhile, I will reconstruct what is past for your benefit, so that you may know the information which I still require. A lady yesterday entered your study. She came with the intention of possessing herself of certain documents which were in your bureau. She had a key of her own. I have had the opportunity of examining yours, and I do not find the slight decoration made in the scratch made upon the varnish which you have produced. You were... Not an accessory, therefore, and she came, so far as I can read the evidence, without your knowledge, to rob you. The professor blew a cloud from his lips. This is most interesting and instructive, said he. Have you no more to add? Surely, having traced this lady so far, you can also say what's become of her. <coughs> I will endeavor to do so. In the first place, she was seized by your secretary and stabbed him in order to escape. This catastrophe, this catastrophe I am inclined to regard as an unhappy accident, for I am convinced that the lady had no intention of inflicting so grievous an injury. An assassin does not come unarmed. Horrified by what she had done, she rushed wildly away from the scene of the tragedy. Unfortunately for her, she had lost her glasses in the scuffle, and she was extremely short-sighted and was really helpless without them. She ran down a corridor, which she imagined to be the one by which she had come in. Both were lined with coconut matting. And it was only when it was too late that she understood that she had taken the wrong passage, and that her retreat was cut off behind her. What was she to do? She could not go back. She could not remain where she was. She must go on. She went on. She mounted the stair, pushed open the door, and found herself in your room. The old man sat with his mouth open, staring wildly at Holmes. Amazement and fear were stamped upon his expressive features. Now, with an effort, he shrugged his shoulders and burst into insincere laughter. <laughs> this is very fine, Mr. Holmes, said he, but there is one little flaw you in your splendid theory. I was myself in my room, and I have never left it during the day. I am aware of that, Professor Coram. And you mean to say that I could lie upon a bed and not be aware a woman had entered my room? I never said so. 
You were aware of it. You spoke to her. You recognized her. You aided in her escape. Again, the professor burst into a high-keyed laughter. He had risen to his feet, and his eyes were glowing like embers. You're all mad, he cried. You are talking insanely. I hoped her to escape. Where is she now? She is there, said Holmes as he pointed to a high bookcase in the corner of the room. I saw the old man throw up his arms, and terrible convulsion passed over his grim face, and he fell back into his chair. At the same instant, the bookcase at which Holmes pointed swung around upon a hinge, and a woman rushed out into your room. You're right, she cried in a strange roaring voice. You're right, I am here. She was brown with the dust and draped in a cobwebs, which had come from the walls from her hiding place. Her face, too, was streaked with grime, and at best she could never have been handsome, for she had the exact physical characteristics which Holmes had divined, with, in addition, a long and obstinate chin. What with her natural blindness, and what with the change of room and from lights to dark, she stood at once dazed, blinked her eyes to see where and who we were. And yet, in spite of these disadvantages, there was a certain nobility in the woman's bearing, a gallantry in her defiant chin, and in the upraised head, which compelled something of respect and admiration. Stanley Hopkins had laid his hand upon her arm and claimed her as the prisoner, but she waved him aside gently, and yet with an obs overmastering dignity which compelled obedience. The old man lay back in his chair, and with a twitching face and stared at her with brooding eyes. Yes, sir, I'm your prisoner, she said. From where I stood I could hear everything, and I know you have learned the truth. I confess it all. It was I who killed the young man, but you are right. You who say it was an accident. But not even... I did not even know that there was a knife which I held in my hand, for in my despair I snatched anything from the table to struck him to make him let go. It is the truth that I tell. Madam, said Holmes, I am sure that is the truth. I fear that you are far from well. She had turned a dreadful color, and the most ghastly under the dark dust streaks upon her face. She seated herself upon the side of the bed. Then she resumed. I have little time here, she said, but I would ha have to know the whole truth. I am this man's wife. He is not an Englishman. He is Russian. His name I will not tell. For the first time, the old man stirred. God bless you, Anna, he cried. God bless you. He cast a look of deepest disdain in his direction. Why should you cling to so hard to the wretched life of yours, Sergius? She said. It has done harm to many and good to none, not even yourself. However, it is not caused to the frail thread that snapped before God's time. I have enough already upon my soul since I crossed the threshold of this cursed house. But I must speak or I shall be too late. I have said, gentlemen, that I am his this man's wife. He was fifty, and I a foolish girl of twenty when we married. It was in a city in Russia, a university. I will not name the place. God bless you, Anna, murmured the old man. We were reformers, revolutionists, nihilists. You understand. He and I, many more. There came a time in trouble. The police officer was killed and many were arrested. Evidence was wanted, and in order to save his own life and to earn a great reward, my husband betrayed his own wife and his companions. 
Yes, we were all arrested upon his confession. Some of us were found on our way to the gallows and some to Siberia. It was among these last, but my term was not for life. My husband came to England with his ill-gotten gains and has lived in quiet ever since, knowing well that if the Brotherhood knew where he was, not a week would pass before justice would be done. The, the old man reached out trembling hand and helped himself to a cigarette. I'm your hands, Anna, said he. You're always good to me. I have not yet told you the height of his villainy, she said. Among our comrades of the order, there was one who was my friend of my heart. He was noble, unselfish, loving, all that my husband was not. He hated violence. We were all guilty, if that's his guilt. But he was not. He wrote forever dissuading us from such a course. These letters would have saved him. So would my diary, in which from day to day I had entered both my feelings towards him and the view of which each of us had taken. My husband found and kept both diary and letters. He hid them, and he tried hard to swear away the young man's life. In this he failed, but Alexis was sent to a convict in Siberia, where now, at this moment, he works in a salt mine. Think of that, you villain! You villain now! Now, at this very moment, Alexis is a man whose name you are not worthy to speak, lives and works like a slave, and yet I have your life in my hands, and I let you go. You are always a noble woman, Anna, said the old man, puffing at his cigarette. She had risen, but she fell back again with a little cry of pain. I'm most English, said she. When my term was over, I set myself to get the diary and letters which, if sent to the Russian government, would procure my friend's release. I knew that my husband had come to England. After months of searching, I discovered where he is. I knew that he was still had the diary, for when I was in Siberia, I had a letter from him once reproaching me for and quoting some passages from its pages. Yet I was sure that with his revengeful nature he would never give it to me, or for his own free will. I must get it for myself. With this object, I engaged an agent from a private detective firm who entered my husband's house as a secretary. It was your second secretary, Sergius, the one who left you so hurriedly. He found the papers were kept in the cupboard, and he got an impression of the key. He would go no farther. He furnished me with the plan of the house, and he told me that in the forenoon the study was always empty, as a secretary was employed up here. So at last I took my courage in both hands, and I came to get the papers for myself. I succeeded, but at what cost? I had just taken the papers and was locking the cupboard when the young man seized me. I had not I had seen him already that morning. He had met me on the road, and I asked him to tell me where Professor Corm lived, not knowing that he was in his employ. Exactly, exactly, said Holmes. The secretary came back and told his employer of the woman's he had met. Then in his last breath he tried to send a message that it was she, the she whom he had just discussed with him. You must let me speak, said the woman with an imperative voice, and her face contracted as if in pain. When he had fallen, I rushed from the room and chose the wrong door and found myself in my husband's room. He spoke of giving me up. I showed him that I, if he did so, his life was in my hands. If he gave me to the law, I would give him to the Brotherhood. It was not that I wished to live for my own sake, but it was that I desired to accomplish my purpose. He knew that I would do what I said, that his own fate was involved with mine. For an instant there was no other he shielded me. He thrust me into the dark hiding place, a relic of old days known only to himself. 
He took his meals in his own room and so was able to give me part of his food. It was agreed that when the police left the house, I should slip away by night and come back no more. But in some way, you have read our plans. She tore from her bosom of her dress a small packet. These are his... My last words, she said. Here is a packet which will save Alexis. I confide it to your honor and to take your love of justice. Take it. You will deliver it to the Russian embassy. Now I have done my duty and... Stop her, said Holmes. He had bounded across the room and had wretched a small vial from her hands. Too late, she said, as she's sinking back on the bed. Too late. I took the poison before I left my hiding place. My head swims. I am going, I charge you, sir, to remember the packet. A simple case, and yet in some ways an instructive one. Holmes remarked as we travelled back to town, it hinged from the outset of a precedent. But for the intricate chance of a dying man having seized these, I am not sure that we ever would have reached our solution. It was clear to me from the strength of the glasses that the wearer must have been very blind and helpless when deprived of them. When you asked me to believe that she walked along a narrow strip of grass without once making a false step, I remarked, as you may remember, that it was a noteworthy performance. In my own mindset, it was an impossible performance, save for the unlikely case that she had a second pair of glasses. I was forced, therefore, to consider the hypothesis that she had remained within the house. On perceiving the similarity of the two corridors, it became clear that she might very easily have made such a mistake, and in that case it was evident that she must have entered the professor's room. I was keenly on the alert, therefore, for whatever would bear out the supposition, I examined the room narrowly for anything in the shape of a hiding place. The carpet seemed continuous and firmly nailed, so I dismissed this idea of a trap door. There might be a recess behind the books. As you are aware, such devices are common in old libraries. I observed the books were piled on the floor at other points, but not at the floor of the bookcase she was behind. This, then, was the door. I could see no marks to guide me, but the carpet was a, din a dun color, which tends to lend itself to examination. I therefore smoked a great number of those excellent cigarettes, and I dropped the ash over the front of the place of the suspected bookcase. It was a simple trick, but exceedingly effective. I then went downstairs and ascertained in your presence, Watson, without your quite perceiving the drift of my remarks, that Professor Quorum's consumption of food had increased, one would expect when he was supplying a second person. We had ascended to the room again, when, by upsetting the cigarette box, I obtained an excellent view from the floor, and was able to see quite clearly from the traces upon the cigarette ash that the prisoner had, in our absence, come out from her retreat. Well, Hopkins, here we are Charing Cross, and I congratulate you on having brought your case to a successful conclusion. You are going to headquarters, no doubt. I think, Watson, you and I will drive together to the Russian embassy. 